I thought it was worth communicating precisely that, as you say, when uh, if you look at many uh, debates uh, that people are having, uh, the feeling one gets is that somehow we are stuck. We haven't had a revolution for a long time. And the question is, what next? And I thought actually the picture that I'm getting from my own uh, research is, is, is very different. It, it feels much more exciting and it really does feel like we are on the brink of a, of, of a revolution. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with quantum information physicist Vladko Vedral about his profound and provocative new book, Portals to a New Reality, Five Pathways to the Future of Physics. Welcome, Vladko. I love the book. Thank you very much. I'm extremely happy to be talking to you about it. Good. Well, we'll have a lot, a lot to say. Let, let's start with, uh, I said it's provocative, and your, your subtitle talks about the, the future of physics. It's about the future of physics. Now, some say that physics doesn't have much of a future. Uh, what's your view of the charge uh, that some make that particle physics is, is stuck, that it hasn't made any progress since the discovery of the Higgs boson in, in, in 2012? Yes, I think that's uh, partly what prompted me to write the book, actually. It's, uh, it's an answer to these kind of um, um, statements that you frequently hear these days. I think we are actually um, at a very good time for physics um, because our technology has now reached a level of sophistication that we can actually ask some of these very fundamental questions. So I think it's a great time to be a physicist. Uh, and probably will have a breakthrough uh, in the near future. So what kind of breakthrough are you looking for? Um, I'm really looking for something that would go beyond the current uh, two theories that we have. Um, everything that we know uh, in our universe, in the micro domain um, and in the macro domain, is described by quantum mechanics on the micro side and general relativity on the macro side. And that really covers all of the experimental evidence we've uh, we've had so far. There is not a single deviation uh, on either the micro or the, mi uh, the macro side. However, the two theories really have never been tested in the region where both of them could matter equally. So, so somehow they have a separate peaceful coexistence mm -hmm. at, at present, uh, whereas I think what's going to have to happen ultimately is that we test them together. And okay. that will tell us. We, we will get into all of that, but first I, I owe it to our audience to uh, give a proper bio. So uh, Vladko Vedral is Professor of Quantum Information Science at the Oxford Quantum Institute at the University of Oxford. His group investigates quantum information from a variety of angles that range from the very abstract and mathematical physics to the more applied in quantum biology. We'll be talking about that later. Uh, an area of current interest is the interface between thermodynamics and quantum physics. He says there are possible applications to finding the limits of energy efficiency in future technology. So he you, uh, in integrates uh, most fundamental physics with, with current te technologies. So Vladko, let's, let's start by just giving me the overarching theme of the book. Uh, the overarching uh, theme really is that um, We've had um, two fundamental uh, theories in physics, quantum mechanics and general relativity, um, really unchallenged um, for the last hundred years or so, uh, for two reasons, I think. And, and th those are the two main themes of the book. One reason is simply that we haven't had the right technology. And what changed in the last maybe two or three decades um, is that there has been an exponential expansion of quantum technologies. Um, people realized around about the, the year 2000 uh, that quantum computers um, and quantum communications could have a wide range of applications. Um, and actually the whole activity then left universities, if you like, and was absorbed by, by the heavy industry. So now we have Google, uh, Microsoft, IBM, all of them are trying to really build a large scale quantum computer. And the technologies that are developed in that direction are the ones that I think will now 
um, uh, tell us quite a bit about fundamental physics. So I really want to use the technologies that are already out there to do that. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, in my view, is that we've had a wrong view of what quantum mechanics is really trying to tell us. So I think we've been stuck um, with a number of interpretations that seem to me not very helpful when it comes to asking questions, what we should really be probing and what, what should we be experimenting on. So on both counts, that's both co very controversial. Normally we think of technologies like quantum computing as being a derived, a, a one-way approach where the fundamental uh, science leads to new technologies like quantum computing. But now you're suggesting that it can go in the reverse direction as well. And I think that's a controversial claim, uh, as well as I, I think you used to say in the book that uh, although every experimental data or observation in cosmology supports general relativity and quantum mechanics is what, 10 digits in, in accuracy uh, yes. experiment, experiment to uh, theory. But you say that even though all this is true, that the, their uh, supreme reign uh, as being the most fundamental may be coming to an end. So that's a pretty strong statement. Yes, and I thought it was worth communicating precisely that, as you say, when uh, if you look at many uh, debates uh, that people are having, uh, the feeling one gets is that somehow we are stuck. We haven't had a revolution for a long time. And the question is, what next? And I thought actually the picture that I'm getting from my own uh, research is, is, is very different. It, it feels much more exciting and it really does feel like we are on the brink of a, of, of a revolution. Like you make the statement that there is uh, no space, no time, no particles, <laughs> that you have a radical vision of what quantum reality is, and it relates to quantum information theory, which is your area of expertise. So what generates that uh, hubris? Um, I, uh, the, the main thesis really um, in, the, in the book is that um, uh, we frequently end up having um, uh, a dichotomy in our view of reality. So we, de we tend to describe the small uh, world using uh, quantum mechanics. And then at some point we introduce, we tend to introduce an artificial division and say the rest of the world is really classical. And um, it seems to me that this generates all uh, the apparent paradoxes. Of course, there are no paradoxes in quantum mechanics, really. But I think if you do introduce, if you sneak in a classical world in some of your assumptions, then you will end up um, uh, concluding something wrongly and it will look inconsistent. Mm. So again, very a very big claim. Uh, you say there are these five experiments that might be able to um, to reveal this. Uh, just pick one and, and describe it. Um, if I was to go for one, probably it would be testing quantum gravity, because that seems to be the, the biggest open problem in physics at present. Um, and that's actually my portal number three in the book, um, which is to say that um, we can do that with lab based experiments. I think that's the surprise number one. So we don't need a heavy a machinery involved in places like CERN or Fermilab, any any activity of that kind. Uh, it could be done at much lower energy um, and it could be done with the technology that we have now, which actually comes directly from, from quantum technology. So what this is testing is whether gravity, um, even at the very low energy limit, has any quantum degrees of freedom. The experiment would be designed to uh, put two masses in a superposition and let them couple uh, through gravity. And then by making measurements at the very end to confirm whether they get entangled, quantum entangled, you would actually be testing the quantum nature of gravity. What is the mass of the uh, the two objects that you want to put into uh, a superposition? That's probably a, a, a big surprise number two, because it's um, below a nanogram. So we are talking about usually usually people are talking uh, about the Planck mass, uh, which is actually quite a large mass. If you if you come from atomic physics, that's 10 to the minus eight kilograms. Here we are talking about, for instance, 10 to minus uh, 14 kilograms or even below. 
uh, it all depends on how long you could uh, maintain the superposition of these masses. Of course, the longer you could do that, um, the, the better it is and the lower the mass. Uh, and you can get accurate measurements from uh, masses that small. Yes, I think the idea is really to uh, to to get um, to make a spatial superposition, which is of course extremely challenging. Then to make sure that the masses themselves are shielded from any other influence. Of course, it could be vibrations, any other noise, electromagnetic, so that whatever remains, you know, really could be attributed to gravity itself. Yeah, that sounds like a challenge. But given given the uh, sophistication of LIGO, the gravity wave detectors and the remarkable uh, capabilities that it has. I mean, it, 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 it sounds like it could be feasible. I think so. It, it yeah. seems to me within a five years or so. Great. Um, uh, let's assume that all of the experiments that uh, the, the, the five portals work out as you would predict. Uh, what then would be the new reality? I think that's always difficult to, to tell because I think my, um, the portals that I'm talking about um, are really designed to probe our current understanding. And uh, of course, I have my own prejudice and I'm betting on uh, how they will come out, uh, the experiments. However, they could always go uh, differently, in which case we have to adjust our view to, uh, to that. Sure, and I appreciate that's the right scientific approach, but I'm trying to get at your, pre your prejudices, your predisposition, my <laughs> where you're coming from. Yes, my main prejudice here really would be that I think we have a, a long way to go with uh, quantization uh, that started, of course, 100 years ago with Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, my feeling is that um, these first experiments will imply that gravity, certainly at the lowest level, is quantum mechanical. Uh, and that will then force us to think longer and hard how we should quantize it. Because even if you conclude that it's quantum at that level, there's still many different ways in which gravity could be quantized. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, which way would you be headed? Because you have uh, a, a, um, a statement in the book which uh, you know, uh, invites incredulity that it, the, uh, the universe could have no bedrock fundamental uh, reality of at, at which you're you, you stop that it could go on uh, uh, with an infinite regress and you know my my simple finite mind says that that's nuts <laughs> yes <laughs> yes it you see that's that's what um, uh, that's what you have to engage in when you're speculating of course none of us really know what comes next but I thought no. it was an interesting um observation that uh, when we do quantum mechanics we actually start with classical mechanics mm -hmm. and then we convert some of these okay. classical entities into quantum entities into into quantum numbers a and actually why stop there is the question why why do we have this hybrid model where still half of the parameters that matter to us are are classical numbers. It seems to me we'll get a lot of mileage by looking at everything quantum me mechanically consistently, um, in which case, you know, the classical universe is only a very special limit of this, but quantumness never disappears and, and, and it's all the way down, really. And, and you talk about different levels of quantization, that it's not just the first level, that you can quantize that level in, in, in uh, I don't know how many, and if that, again, that, that, boggles the mind. <laughs> yes, and, and it could be tested, which is interesting. So whenever you couple two, as you say, whenever you couple uh, quantum mechanically two systems, there is always a constant in front, which is a classical parameter, which yeah. tells you how strongly they couple to one another. Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately with this frame of mind, you're thinking, why not quantize that? What if that's part of a larger reality as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's a take home message that you would like readers to get from uh, the book? Um, I, you know, it's a, it's um, portals to a new reality. It, it, each of the, those segments, the idea of the portals being the experiments to really understand it in depth and the new reality. So what's a take home message from the book? I think the, the, the take home message is, you know, I wrote the book for, uh, probably the teenage version of myself <laughs> you know i was imagining what would i like to have read this yeah. is the time when i was starting to get into uh, into science myself and i think uh, the message really is that um 
physics is um, physics is still an extremely exciting activity. It's telling us something very profound about the universe. And in fact, it seems to me um, what I envisage is that the next three or four decades in science in general uh, will be dominated by quantum mechanics leaving the microscopic domain and going into the macro domain, going into chemistry, going into biology, going even beyond that, trying to explain the whole universe. So I wanted to communicate this excitement uh, about what I think will be the, the near future development of science. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.